out on some difficulties here. Like the eternal city that is Rome, where the ecclesiastical splendor of the Renaissance completely enthralls the imagination. The dome of St. Peter's rises upwards like a heavenly choir. From the topmost pinnacle, the centuries that are Rome spread out in everlasting significance. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast this Saturday evening. Uh, well, I just arrived 20 minutes late, so we're off to a good start. But uh, we have two interesting guests on today, uh, more so a, a co-host of sorts. Uh, Simon will help me out with uh, the interview. Um, so the main event is Brother Andrew. Brother Andrew Kosmowski, did I pronounce that correctly? Kosmowski is the Kosmowski. easier all right so uh the first thing that stands out is the brother uh, at the front of your name at the start of your name um so are you a monk uh like but canonically no yes so, uh, uh, there's a canonical distinction between monks and nuns and brothers and sisters but we'll just leave it at that because i can't begin to explain that difference so <laughs> so uh you're you're in religious life though Correct. And you're in the Society of Mary. That's at the end of your name. As Correct. Known. The Marianists. There's two societies of Mary. Mm -hmm. So the other uh, is the Marists. So. Yeah. So this order is like, um, is it a North American thing, or are they uh, located in? Uh, the so upper we're part worldwide. Of we were founded in France in. 1817, after Father Chaminade returned back from exile after the French Revolution and spit from Spain, he returned back to Bordeaux and started founding lay sodalities to serve the good of the, of the city, the good of the diocese. And from there, he was put in contact with a woman, blessed Adèle de Bastet de Troncaléon, uh, who was doing something very similar in her city of Agen, and the two came were connected through letters, um, and her order, the Marianist Sisters, as we call them now, also known as the Daughters of Mary Immaculate, came to be in 1816, and we came to be in 1817. Yeah, so it's an old order, very old order. Well, not um, very old. We're not the Benedict Benedictines. <laughs> Yeah, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, when did you join the order? What so, I professed my first vows in 2006. I was in formation from 2003 through 2006 in Butte in preparation for vows and then in the temporary vows until 2010. Mm -hmm. So, I guess we should go even further back. Uh, what led you to um to discern the religious life um, so after i graduated college i had this feeling come up um, that it was something worthwhile but i wasn't certain what to do with it so i went to work at nature's classroom came back saw a priest i knew he was on sabbatical from being rector of, of a seminary in nigeria and he advised me to continue doing what i was doing for the year and then come back. So in that year of, in that additional year of working at Nature's Classroom, I found Visions Vocation Magazine by the National Religious Vocation Conference. Uh, that was helpful in terms of providing good articles to provide some clarity. And it also has these different advertisements, if you want, on um, about different religious orders, their websites, what they're doing, photos, da da da. And so I found the Marianists, one of many that were in there. Um, I, was, I was working at Nature's Classroom, which was long days, short nights, and one internet line back in the day. So <laughs> I discerned, I decided on looking at orders with Mary in the name. So while we know the Order of Preachers has a great love for Mary, Order of Preachers does not have Mary in the name. Yeah. 
Um, so to me, that was a part that I had value on. So, uh, do you enjoy Saint Alphonsus Liguori, uh, particularly like the Glories of Mary? That book. I have not. You haven't read it, or you haven't? Uh, I have heard not it? read it. Oh, oh, yeah. I need to read that one as well. It's um, yeah, it's a classic. I think uh, mm -hmm. in Marian spirituality, mm -hmm. but. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, did you have like any examples of people like in the religious life or did you grow up around? Nope, nope. None at all. Nope, nope. So, so what were your first impressions of people in the religious life then, being an outsider? I knew that it existed. So that's an important part. I knew religious life for men existed. I knew that there were brothers not that I had met any, but I knew there were. So I yeah. can't say I had anything other than they are. Mm -hmm. And then in, in, I was starting to look at this in, in deeply about 2000 ish. Mm -hmm. And that, so that's just after I graduated college. Um, thought maybe youth ministry, uh, and that wasn't quite the direction God was pushing me in. Was close-ish. <laughs> yeah. Um, then so after yeah, you mentioned, um, you mentioned like a feeling. What was that feeling uh, that you felt? Uh, the first impulse or catalyst. Uh, So it's been nearly 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think for me, I would say things like a longing. Mm -hmm. um, a longing for, for the community or... Um, I would go and say a longing for feeling whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what for you, me, I yeah, go yeah. to, I was starting to look at different religious orders. I started with the Marianists because Mary in the name. Um, I was in an environmental education program and we have a center. I had teaching credentials. We have schools. Yeah. I'm not doing any of those things now, but that's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of, I think, where I was going in my thought process. Why yeah. like the Society of Mary? Um, I then spent a week with the brothers here in Dayton at different places, and it just felt like I had found home. So... Um... You mentioned like the um, longing for like wholeness. So, what were some of the things that completed that, uh, that filled that hole in your heart? Or, um, so so that's changed since I've been a brother in terms of that sense of wholeness. Um, yeah, I think first off, a an honest and healthy community life. It's community life is not roses without thorns. Yeah. Um, I liken community life to uh, a rock tumbler <laughs> in that we're the rocks that are put in the machine and the sand is God's grace. And ideally at the end, our rough edges are made smooth and become these beautiful things that we call saints. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. So yeah, like I'm um, just working at a monastery. I can kind of comment on that a bit. Like I was um, like my first day of working, I quickly realized that monks are average people. They are people. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's one misunderstanding that people have uh, looking in at like even religious life. Um, these They almost think like you are a saint. Like if you're in religious life, you're automatically a saint. Uh, Mm -hmm. They forget the human aspect to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, how have people treated you um, since you've joined religious life? Uh, treated you differently 
than before. I don't know if it's treated differently. Um, because it's really hard to say that, to answer that question. Um, certainly not my family. <laughs> yeah. Um, as, as you hear in the gospel, there, there are no prophets in their hometowns. <laughs> um, so not really, not really my immediate family. Um, so they don't call you, they don't call you brother Andrew. My aunt, one of my aunts does, but I also like I'm not going to push that issue. I, yeah, it's, I mean I, I have it up here that way everyone knows. Mm -hmm. That is a little strange. Your own mother calling you brother, like in the case of <laughs> priests, father. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, I think that's the common uh, way uh, people in religious life or the priesthood do that. Uh, mm -hmm. I guarantee you there's some out there that make their mother call them father or uh mm -hmm. so yeah um so you haven't noticed too big of a change like in how people um see you or um how about like in their interactions with you do they uh um i don't want to say treat you differently but uh, since i've already said that but um, um what do you mean uh, so yeah, I was hoping you would, uh, go off that. Um, I don't really know well, what I'm getting at, but, uh, um, brother yeah, Andrew, yes, he notably does not have a habit. His order yes. does not use habits. So, uh, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the habit, brother Andrew? So I am wearing my order's traditional garb. The, the black suit, suit, the white shirt, the white tie. Um, this, is, this is traditional since this is what what men of the professional class, the bourgeoisie in France were wearing at the time. So it has evolved a little bit. It's harder to find Prince Albert coats now than it was 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's the traditional garb that we, that we wear. Um, it also goes back to something that's in our foundational documents. There's a letter by Blessed Adele to one of her sisters saying that there's that Father, Blessed Father Shamnat is going to found an order of men who will be the leaven of the world. So if we wear clothes similar to the world, we can easily be more hidden and be that type of leaven. Mm hmm. So I do most do most of the brothers wear like the suit, the black suit. Not all, not all the time, more or less. Often. Particular particular apostolates, um, like funerals, professions of vows, jubilees, and ordinations. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's in my province. If you were to go to some other provinces, this would be more common. Yeah. So uh, how would you respond to like the argument that uh, like if you become a part of the world that uh, people won't be able to see the example? Like you mentioned, it was important that you knew that people in religious life existed. Uh, mm -hmm. So do you think um, like blending into the world almost eliminates that uh, potential, I guess, of knowing that religious uh, people in religious life are out there and that it exists as this distinct thing? Um, I don't think that is necessarily the, th the thing. I don't think that's necessarily mm -hmm. the question you're asking, Michael. Um, I think in the Catholic Church, we know religious exist, whether we're, whether we're visible yeah. or not is a different question. Um, and I would hazard that, like, like the monks at Gethsemane don't wear their habits all the time, I suspect. You're right. Um, I suspect that for many orders that ha would have a traditional habit, they're not worn every time they go someplace or mm -hmm. every time they're in the fields. In, in, in your case, with the, with the Trappist there, Michael, that literally are in the fields. <laughs> uh, not so much anymore uh, once they stop making cheese. But, uh... 
That would explain why I can't find the smoked cheese on the website anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. They still have the cheese boxes, though. Uh, they keep everything. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go off on a tangent. Yep, but, uh, yep. So, so the brothers, like the sisters, don't always wear the habit. And even if we do wear the traditional garb, it may not be what many folks think of as the traditional garb, what, what a brother or a sister should be wearing. Yeah. So uh, what do you think of like the Dominican garb? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? It's sort of an offhand question. Um, so my first question is, how do they keep them as pristinely white as they do? <laughs> um, but no, I have I have no issues with. I don't have a question on habit or no habit. To me, this is a non-issue that a lot of folks want to make an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that it's a non-issue because the habit is the exterior piece of religious life. And it is, to me, the parsley of religious life. The meat and the potatoes is the formation that goes on to form the brother, to form the sister. Mm -hmm. And there are various reasons why brothers, sisters, priests don't wear the garb. Sometimes a priest just wants, we don't see priests wearing the clerics if they're going to the gym working out. Yeah. So sometimes it's a matter of being inconvenient for the time, for the, what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's, I just want to watch a movie incognito. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's it's not so much time off as much as that that little bit of I don't want to be recognized right away. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Sam, any, any thoughts on that? Any follow up questions? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of habits and be, them being visible. I don't want to be like the guy who contradicts, but. I am a big fan of the uh, order of preachers and their habit. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, like I saw back home, I'm, I'm all the way in British Columbia right now, but I'm from Virginia. Back in Virginia, we have a, a parish of Dominicans at the University of Virginia. Um, and I once saw one of them grocery shopping, mm -hmm. but they weren't wearing their habit. And I was like, that's strange. I thought, I thought it would have been really cool to see them wearing the habit out at the grocery store um, because I think that like the, the kind of witness and testimony that you bring to the world and to the mm -hmm. public by just being out there, like wearing your religious habit, like no fear, no shame um, is powerful. Um, and it, for me, being someone who's interested in the Dominicans and also um, I think for a lot of people who are maybe a little bit afraid of their faith, like people like knowing that, they're Catholic, seeing the habit, someone wearing the habit out in public like that can make mm -hmm. them, you know, feel stronger and feel better about like being publicly Catholic and like not being ashamed and afraid about it. So, yeah, that's, um, I've heard that exact uh, belief before, but I both uh, agree and disagree with Andrew, brother Andrew. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree about like the time and the place. Uh, you don't always have to wear it, like going to sleep. Uh, yeah, or going to the gym, like, fair enough, yeah. Yeah. I guess, um, yes, yeah, so, like, the argument for, like, a uniform is, like, uh, people at the post office, or they call it the deliverers, the mail deliverers, mm -hmm. delivery men, I guess. Uh, so they wear the uniform, firemen wear the uniform, police officers wear the uniform. Uh, and so it kind of, like, represents who they are in society. Like, you see a police officer, you know that's a police officer. Uh, you see a clown, you know it's a clown. <laughs> but um, so yeah, there is a. But you mentioned like there is moments where you feel the need to go incognito, uh, such as like going to the movie or. Um, so yeah, can you the expand gym. on? Yeah, <laughs> the gym. <laughs> Have you ever seen any Dominicans go to the gym? Do they do they keep the habit at the gym? <laughs> But uh, yeah, can you um, 
why do you feel the need to go incognito, like uh, to take a break from everything almost? Uh, so to be clear for us, our foundation, we've been dressed like the people. So mm -hmm. that way we can better be that leaven for the world, that secret religious order that that Blessed Marie de la Concepcion would speak about. And, and she is also Blessed Adele, just so you know, I'm referring to the same person. Mm -hmm. So it, it is just that it's coming out of the French Revolution in some ways that it Father Shaman, I believe that a new type of religious order was needed for re-Christianizing France. So he felt that the robes were not the best way to go about. Whereas by dressing as the people who have seen folks in robes being decapitated, mm -hmm. Especially just so, especially when you remember that in the French Revolution there were two periods of exiles, and Father Chaminade was forced to leave in the second wave, but state would never left during the first. Yeah. So it was a question of does Father Chaminade want his sodalities, his the religious orders he helps found to literally be killed off. Mm -hmm. So for him, it was a matter of, in some ways, protecting his disciples. So that way we wouldn't be necessarily recognized right away. But the dress became, the, the, this type of dress became so well known for us that we would become known as we just become known in, in wearing this. So well, some of the brothers have shared a story of one of the one of the students in the school they were working at died suddenly. Mm. And the brothers all went in the black and whites. And one of the folks commented, oh, look, the brothers have come. <laughs> so we've become known it with wearing it. And if we don't wear it, that's not the end of the world, like where I where I'm at now, everyone knows that I'm a brother. I don't have to wear this, just make that mark. Whereas when I taught parish school, then the contract was the brother will dress in garb traditional to the order. I had to stress, this is the order. This is the garb traditional to my order. Mm -hmm. so. See, I think uh, to provide some further thoughts, maybe a new aspect, uh, like uh, the reason I started wearing suits and stuff uh, was just to remind me that I'm in like the presence of God, the presence of the company of the angels. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I think that's one of the things that kind of helped me uh, get out of sin almost in a way, because like if I lose that knowledge of being in the presence of God, I'll quickly fall into sin. Um, so like just coming home from church and continue to wearing uh, the same uh, dress uh, rather than put on like, something comfortable like sweatpants uh which i usually did back then uh, just a few months ago mm -hmm. but i'm um, just keeping on like the suit like i'm able to get more work done almost in a way uh mm -hmm. like for the website and everything because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it kind of helps the interior in a way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i can i can understand that um, because what it, it does it it gives you that extra confidence that you have dressed yourself for success. Yeah. And there are those out there who would liken the habit of the religious to putting on the armor of God and all that part mm -hmm. that, that we hear as Paul writes in one of his letters. Almost in a way to remind them that they, they are monks, uh, Mm -hmm. they've uh, made the decision to join the monastic life and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i guess the other reason would be to kind of like in the reason for like the tonsure and all that uh shave off the head or shave off the hair not the head mm -hmm. uh, was to kind of make everyone equal in a way um 
So like these exterior things like a nice dress, clothing, even hair um, couldn't um, be a division point amongst the brothers. They were all equal. They looked the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, another order that wears like the suit, the black suit is the geek squad at Best Buy. <laughs> if you're familiar with them. Or know. the Church of Latter-day Saints. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. right. <laughs> I've seen um, a, like a music video of like uh, them singing. They're all wearing suits. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's all the same suit. There's no color to it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to see. But, but if you if you come across the, the missionaries of the Church of Latter-day Saints more recently, they're now with a variation of ties, a variation of slacks. But it is still the white shirt yeah <laughs> with, with the nameplate so you can kind of tell when there's two of them together even if you don't see the nameplate you can kind of just you, you you know there's something going on and i think that's what how you can tell if someone if your soul is receptive how you can tell if someone is a brother or a sister even if they're not in their order's traditional garb. i think in some ways yeah souls are longing for holiness and they're starting to recognize within this person a depth an authenticity a reality that that they want but are having difficulty finding elsewhere mm-hmm. so yeah we've uh, talked about the garb a bit um so Simon, where do you think we should go next? What should be our next uh, route? Um, I I think it's an interesting question to uh, ask uh, Brother Andrew. Why not be ordained as a priest? Um. So in my congregation, only about a third are ordained worldwide. So there's ample reason to say no if that's truly God's calling is to be a lay religious and not an ordained religious. And there's ample opportunity to say yes, if the calling is to become a, an, an ordained priest, de- deacon priest for the order. Um, for me, the answer was no. And that was the right answer because yes would have been for all the wrong reasons. Mm. Like would have come out of me and not coming out of God. And we have enough priests in the church today whose ordination is coming out of themselves and not out of God's will for them. We don't need one more. We're dealing with the ramifications of that already in the world and not just the normal human sinfulness stuff. Yeah. What I also you... saw, to, this might be the sec, a sub-question, of why an order and not the diocese? Mm-hmm. Sure. So I, I also felt the diocese, from my experience, was a, was a lonely life. Just the priest in the rectory in the small rural parish with limited goings-ons, if you would. Like my parish, mm-hmm. there was no youth group, so we were just the catechetics. Um, so it's a matter of so how do we do this? I'm just like no, nah, I didn't. I I know I can get into plenty of trouble myself on my own. Mm-hmm. I do not sure. need the devil saying, "Ooh, do this, do that." Like I can do this or that without the devil when I'm living alone. <laughs> so yeah, see, we have a question here, and we'll go ahead and take that since we. Don't get too many questions yet. Um, Jake and Anna ask, uh, since the Society of Mary was established in France, what does the apostolate of the society look like in the context of the United States or Mexico versus in, say, France or Spain? So historically, we have sought to, so the charism is to build Christian community, small Christian community, um, with the idea being that as we build it, 
those who have joined it will slowly start to bring that sense of Christian community to their workplaces, to their families, to other places that they live in. Um, historically, we've used schools for this, and especially in places such as Spain, in Togo, in, in, in Eastern Africa, the school is our vehicle for helping to form a small Christian community. With the idea being that the students can then help catechize their parents. In the United States, we, and in the United States and in Spain, this education sense took different turns. So it's not just in schools. Um, in Spain, they, many of the brothers are still in schools but we also have a publishing house for textbooks there, um, well regarded throughout Spain um, and the Spanish speaking world. And the Spanish equivalents of the Newberry and Caldecott are sponsored by Editorial SM, our publishing house. Say that five times fast. That five times fast. <laughs> <Got me. laughs> um, so, but in the States, our sense of education shifted first from parish schools to secondary schools to universities. And that's been the trend. It's not how we first came. And we first came to Dayton and we founded more or less a secondary school. I'm not fully certain of the history of St. Mary's Institute as a whole, but I do know that it was partly a secondary school. It was a boarding school as well. Um, mm -hmm. And from that sprung Chaminade, which moved just closer to downtown Dayton and where St. Mary's Institute was, became the University of Dayton. So we, we entered into higher education in a few different places. Um, St. Mary's University in San Antonio and Central Catholic sprung from the school we had that is on the river walk now called El Colegio. And that's a, not, not a high school anymore, but the two sprung from that place for where our first work was. Um, and in Honolulu, we have St. Louis High School and Chaminade University. So we, in Ponce, when we were in Ponce, Puerto Rico, there was El Ponceño, the, the high school, and then there's the uni the Catholic University still in Ponce that we helped establish. So we have these different, we've had these two different expressions of education. Um, in India and in Eastern Africa, it become the, the sense becomes different. So we have the traditional education, if you would, the schools, but in Eastern Africa and India, there's little institutes that help teach trades, like like mm -hmm. tailoring and 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 so, and that. I think tailoring, um, welding, um, other pieces that because we understand that these are skills that are, our students can use in the world to get them to have money on their tables, so they themselves can have families. Yeah, and so I shouldn't have been surprised that you know a lot about your order, a lot about the um, <laughs> history and the. Uh, different locations but uh speaking of surprises um what's uh the biggest surprise that you've encountered so far in the religious life that you didn't expect uh coming in i the sense that the reasons we enter may not become the reasons we stay mm. Um, it's a really good answer. So, like, I entered the Marianists. I've been doing environmental education. I have teaching fields. I am not in environmental education, nor do I have teaching fields anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I'm librarian. I've been a librarian at the University of Dayton for five years before my current work here at the North American Center for Marianist Studies. Um, so you get, you're seeing my the background is my office with all the yeah. book carts and boxes and papers and all that such that librarians sometimes 
become cluttered in a way. Some don't, some do, I do. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that part right there. Uh, I entered an order because I figured I would be teaching at one of our schools and I'm no longer at one of our schools. And I've been nearly 10 years out of high school education in, in terms of working in one of our high schools. Yeah. So you mentioned that 10 year mark in the, or you mentioned 10 years, but I've heard firsthand from monks that around uh, year 10, like a lot of temptations creep in uh, to like give up religious life, to go back mm -hmm. into the world. Mm -hmm. um, did you experience that as well? So I experienced that during my novitiate. So mm -hmm. the novitiate is a phase of intense formation. So the candidate learns about the order's history, the order's spirituality, some basics of the scripture, some basics of liturgy. Um, so that way in some ways we're becoming church professionals. Mm -hmm. so, so for me, it became a sense of around Thanksgiving. So we're maybe so maybe three months in, um, the doubt started to come up. Yeah. And they went away the first Wednesday of Lent. Not Ash Wednesday, but the first Wednesday of Lent where we have the Old Testament reading is Jonah converting Nineveh. Yeah, what's the name of that Wednesday? Um, it's like first Jew Wednesday of Lent. Geosema or something, isn't it? Uh, I saw so in I, the ordinary form, it's the first Wednesday of Lent. <laughs> um, Simple but, one. But the gospel takes that passage from Jonah and says, Jesus says to the Pharisees, something like, only the wicked seek signs. And here I've been seeking signs. Do I stay? Do I go? And like, oh, okay. If we were sitting and not standing, I'd be crawling under the chair right now. But I'm standing, so I can't. Okay, that's clear enough. Um, I can't say that I've had the temptation to depart since then. But I do know that some others do get that from time to time. Yeah. And so do you like prepare for like a future um, or do you prepare for like future temptations that you think will come? Uh, no. Uh, temptations to leave. I don't even know what those temptations will be. Yeah. So just when they come. I think with formation, the goal is that first vows point to perpetual vows. Mm -hmm. And by the time the candidate is taking first vows, those candidates, they have seen religious life. They have seen our ugliness. They have seen our warts. Um, and if they know that they can live the life with us, then that needs to be in their mind as we continue on in temporary vows to perpetual vows. Yeah. I know there's a lot of folks out there who would say your numbers in formation, brother, there it's a slow number. When we look at this particular order over here, and we see that they're drawing mounds of novices. Mm -hmm. What that's doing is neglecting that our one or two novices a year are very often staying through perpetual vows. Whereas this order here with 25, 30 novices, maybe five are getting to perpetual vows. Yeah. So that order has lost a lot of resources on formation, whereas we're still maintaining those resources, um, choosing 
quality versus quantity. Yeah, and so I think you've uh, you've talked about this before. I remember I asked the question like, uh, in what ways could Western monasticism be revived? And you answered, um, it's God's will that some orders die out, some others grow. So um, it's God's will, like for certain mm -hmm. orders to succeed at certain times, and mm -hmm. other uh, orders to succeed mm -hmm. at different times, at later times. Um, or to put it differently, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. For the re religious order has a particular mission for a particular time in a particular place. And at times that time ends. Sometimes it just ends in a certain place. Sometimes it ends throughout the whole world. Many religious orders have sprung up. But after the, the death of the founder, they don't stay as an order. They become the they end, they enter into different congregations. So we know that those fruits were important for the church at that very specific locality. Mm -hmm. And others, they're good for a, a longer period of time. So if we look at the, the the famous Benedictine Abbey that is like in Einsiedel, Switzerland. The Benedictines have been there for centuries. A thousand years, probably. So they still have a mission that they have been entrusted by the Holy Spirit. When we look at different dioceses restructuring, they're trying to be faithful to the mission of bringing the sacraments to the people. But we as the faithful need to understand that it's going to look different. Mm -hmm. so we you mentioned not like have a priest coming three times on a Sunday. It might be down to once. Yeah, it's the flexibility. We have yeah. to pray that in this process of numerous dioceses rearranging the pair structure that it will help prevent the pastors from getting burnout because if a pastor is getting a burnout how can he be an effective pastor he, he can't so in some yeah. dioceses we're seeing larger we're seeing we're seeing what's called families of parishes, um, but really they're canonical. The family of parishes is really the canonical parish of the merging of two or three or four parishes together, not for the sake of closing churches, but for the sake of preventing the priests from being pastors when they're not ready. Yeah. And then getting priests who lose their fire for so there's that zeal for souls that they're supposed to have because a lot of their work is now being administrative instead of pastoral mm -hmm. so yeah how much uh, more time do you have brother andrew i know you have, uh... we got time i'm not i'm not going anywhere i yeah. can see my house window from my office window <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'll let Simon. Simon, do you have any more questions off the top of your head? Um, I mean, I was kind of wondering from way earlier now mm -hmm. um, with regards to like priesthood versus uh, just being like a brother religious. Um, what what might a person feel who's discerning that, who's discerning religious life um, or priesthood or both? So... I think there's going to be a lot of overlap. I think it's going to be a, a question of things like an openness to serving God, no matter how Jesus is calling him, her to holiness. Because women are called to consecrated life or marriage or single life, and men can be called to diocesan life, religious life, um, or married life or the single life. So 
So it becomes a question of, first, how is Jesus calling each of us to personal sanctity? From there, then it becomes, if we're looking at consecrated life, which charism, which gift of the Holy Spirit for the church at this particular moment of time is attractive to the candidate? Because that will be the path of holiness within consecrated life. So for, for a man, the question becomes, am I called to lay ministry, like, like um, catechists, um, youth ministers, um, liturgists, these types of pieces? Or am I called to diocesan priesthood or am I called to religious life? And I think the question becomes for those two, how far is the candidate willing to move to serve Christ? Um, so for the Trappists, they generally don't move. <laughs> yeah. But they also generally don't leave the Abbey, period. Mm -hmm. So they could have grown up right next door. And when they enter, never see the family again, except for their family's funerals. Yeah, and so that's uh, what somebody in the chat asked. I don't know if you saw that, but they said, uh, do you find that a large number of initiates get homesick? Um, I won't say homesick, but I think in, for some, there's an over-romanticization of community life. I think there's the expectation that our sinfulness disappears upon entering the abbey, upon entering the convent. Um, yeah. And I think in some ways it looks like it's amplified, but I think it's more we become better aware of our sinful tendencies. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like it's amplified when really it's just the windows being washed a little bit more <laughs> and we can see our soul that little bit better. I, I do know that some do get homesick, but I think that would especially be the case, uh, like back before the second Vatican council, when they were drafted, I'll use the word drafted just outside high school or just as their seniors in high school, why don't you come join the brothers? Oh, okay. I don't know what I'm doing, but sure. As opposed to now in many orders where it's a good discernment, a good can conversation. Um, many vocation directors, religious and diocesan, have no objection to a candidate withdrawing to a seminary and leaving if it's been a good discernment. I think laity will say this is a failed vocation. And I think that the vocation directors will say, no, it's unjust to the candidate, to the church as a whole, to the institute or the diocese for someone to take vows or to be ordained when that truly is not how Jesus is calling them to grow in holiness. Yeah, I think that was a really good response. Yeah, I think uh, this is the most viewers we had uh, on for a live stream. Uh, so it, it got up to like nine a second ago. But it's good to see the streams active. They all came for you, Brother Andrew, as well as Simon. <laughs> Not, me. Not me. So, yeah. Simon, do you have any more questions? Uh, um, I got a few, but I'll let you, uh, I know you have some questions that you've wanted to ask brother Andrew, so I'll let you take care. Of I mean, things. I mean, I can always come up with questions, hopefully, but, um, yeah. are, are, are you guys able to see your family? Yes. Yes. Um, either they come to me or I go to them. Um, I went to visit my family in February. I found the Christmas tide gets a little busy in terms of a lot of folks with whom I work, they themselves go to visit their families. 
Mm -hmm. So I'll just stay put and get some work done and move the books around on the shelves with no one around so I can move them to my heart's content and everyone's going to come back and they'll have no clue where anything is because they've all been moved. <laughs> um, that happened in January. That is a true story. I, I moved believe them in December. It. January, someone was looking for something like, wait a minute. Those are on that shelf over there before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, so in in my congregation, we're encouraged to to visit our families with some regularity, um, and the family's encouraged to visit the brothers with some regularity. So, do you know how that varies from order to order? Uh, I suspect some like the Carmelites, like Saint Teresa of Lisieux. If you read a story of of a soul her family would visit well her sisters who are in the convent could just stay there and and they could talk at, during recreation or periods like that but her family that were not in the convent they would go in the parlor uh, the sisters would be separated by a grill so there would be a distinct separation in the visit I suspect something kind of similar with the Trappists. That the family, if the family does come for a visit, there's going to be a special parlor or something. Yeah, they, across the street, there's a retreat house. Uh, it's called the family house. Mm -hmm. uh, just for the family to stay. Probably mm -hmm. 30 rooms, so it's a pretty big uh, facility. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, Elf uh, also asked a really good question. Uh, have you felt like you had to revert to your old ways when around people from your past, particularly, particularly those who aren't Christian? Um, I felt like when, at times when I visited my family that sometimes that happens mm -hmm. um i think with a lot of the friends i ha haven't really seen many of my high school classmates since 2006 like we were supposed to have a 25 year reunion recently in 2021 but you tell me what happened with that year to figure out what happened <laughs> it was a blessing <laughs> you got out of that <laughs> um but a lot of my closer friends now i've gotten to know since i've been a brother so it's really kind of hard for me to answer that question and it's not anything other than time mm-hmm so i think like uh people not in religious life also experience that like with their old high school friends or even just friends in general like they can be a bad influence or a good influence so mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. like post conversion or post just that's it living that's your 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 catholic life more seriously and growing in virtue it, mm -hmm. it's weird to go back to people who you were friends with before and interact with them um because, yeah, because there's like a disconnect there between who you were and how you acted and what they expect you to be like and who you are in the present. Mm -hmm. So, that yeah, that's, uh, we can uh, use that for a good basis for a question. Um, but I'll ask another question first. Are there any um, people, uh, your brothers, fellow brothers, that are a hindrance to your, um, your self-improvement, uh, like your calling? So let me say what has been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. Mm -hmm. What do you like most about the community? The brothers. What do you like least about the community? The brothers. <laughs> um, and it's and it's like I said earlier with the rock tumbler, um, where we will at times scrape and scratch at each other. But we have to remember that it's out of love that we're doing this. And sometimes our humanness comes out over the love. Mm -hmm. And that can that can cause minor scratches, that can cause deep wounds. 
And I think that's where, when I talk about an over romanticization of community life, that for some candidates, maybe they themselves are unwilling to deal with their own sinfulness. Maybe they see the sinfulness of the brothers or sisters in the community and feel there's this disconnect of, I thought I was entering a holy place and yet they're like the people outside. It's like, well, we're people, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but so Francis, what does he like least? It's the brothers for, for Blessed Chaminade. It's community life as penance par excellence. So you have no need to enter into into strict penance practices during Lent. Um, it's that understanding that the common life is going to bring up in a very particular way our own sinful tendencies that will grate on others as their sinful tendencies will grate on me. Well, yeah, that um, that happened. But, to me yeah, go finish your thought time, there. My virtue, my growth in virtue, will assist my brother's growth in virtue, just as my brother's growth in virtue will assist me to grow in virtue. Yeah, I, think, I was going to say, like, just being around people, um, any people, eventually uh, they'll start to grade against you. It's like my old college roommate. He had uh, the keyboard clicks on his phone. So he's um, like, I'm just in the room trying to do homework. He's over there clicking away on his phone, texting or something. Uh, it drove me crazy. Eventually, like during the last month of college, I got him to, we signed an agreement or something to, he uh, turns that turns the keyboard clicks off and I, I did something for them, but uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, um, that's also not unique to religious life, but mm -hmm. I think people, uh, they kind of romanticize it, as you said, and they misunderstand that, um, it's also common to religious life, but on the bright side, um, how do you think being around like-minded people has helped you grow as a Christian? people striving for holiness and that have taken a really, they've taken on a lot of responsibility. In fidelity to prayer, that the brothers show up, even if they're tired, the brothers show up, even if they'd rather be someplace else. To me, that is a helpful piece. Yeah, and so like just in my own personal life, um, when I get home from work, uh, so I'll eat uh, lunch first, but at 1.30, every day at 1.30, I'll uh, drop my knees before the crucifix and just pray uh, one um, Our Father and three Hail Marys. Mm -hmm. And that has really helped eliminate a lot of sin. Because um, usually I Back in the day, I would come home from work. Um, I wouldn't turn to God, so I'd become distracted by things in a way. But uh, just doing that, uh, just those like four short prayers, it reminds me for the rest of the day of God, and that keeps me from sin. It's like um, I think it was St. Teresa of Avila that said, um, if you remember God, you won't sin. Mm -hmm. So it's just forgetting about God. Yeah. So yeah, Brother Andrew, are there any questions that uh, you wanted us to ask you, but we haven't asked you yet <laughs> to put all the work on you? <laughs> I always like doing that. <laughs> um, I have questions for you. Both. Go ahead. Um, what have your experiences been with, with religious, with brothers and sisters? Well, I guess I'll go first. Uh, just working at a monastery, I've had uh, lots of experiences. Uh, I still meet new monks, like almost probably every two weeks, I'll meet like a new monk or um, a new monk will start working where I work. And so we'll begin to talk. But uh, 
I've definitely met some very holy people. Uh, seeing like some of the old people that have been monks for like 40, 30 years. Almost. Old people at 30, who are you talking about? You haven't <laughs> seen the brothers who have been in religious life for 80 years then. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think one joined when he was 18 and he's mm -hmm. like 87 now. Mm -hmm. He'll be coming on the podcast here soon. He was, um, I don't know what the word is, but Thomas Merton was his novice master. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. But, um, so yeah, like, uh, I've met some of the nicest people I think I'll ever meet. Um, some of the monks, there's like, it's almost indescribable, but un indescribable, but, uh, like for, for, I'll use one monk as, as an example, I won't mention his name, but, uh, he always, uh, is looking to help others. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, once I dropped like a bunch of boxes, like before I even bent down to start picking them up, he's already down there picking them up. Uh, and just putting them back on the table but uh just simple acts like that i think uh, you mentioned saint uh therese uh i can't say it in french um yeah that, that was her whole thing the little way so uh there's lots of monks that follow that little way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah i think that's uh that's a good uh five minute tirade not five minutes <laughs> Yes, Simon, <laughs> your turn. Um, I have not been blessed with the opportunity to work at a monastery, but it, um, <laughs> I do have some experience with religious. Um, as I said, back home, uh, the uh, Dominicans are there. I actually haven't interacted too much with the Dominicans, um, like talking to them. Uh, I, I actually I became interested in them mm -hmm. after after I really like spent most of my time with them. Um, because then I, I moved to like going to another parish, which had uh, Latin mass and I started serving over there. But um, I think, yeah, I think it, the way that they come off depends on the order that they're a part of. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that the Dominicans are definitely a lot more, not in a bad, like not, not to like bring up a false dichotomy, but like more down to earth only in the sense that they, their job as the order of preachers is somewhat to be like, get to you as somebody who's part of the world is like really to understand you and appeal to you um <clears throat> and so they speak in that way it comes off that way especially like at the university they like their university ministry and so like that's the way that they talk to to people um but i also have experience with uh, like i come from a colombian family where uh they were that my family immigrated uh here to the united states um and so back in Colombia, we have a family friend who's an Augustinian pre, uh, priest, and um, he he really strikes me as somebody special for the peace that he has. Mm -hmm. He has an incredible peace that I have never seen in, I don't think, many people, a few priests that I know, but not many people. And but yeah, he has a, a lot of discipline and willingness to sacrifice himself. For, mm -hmm. for his order. Um, he does a lot of work down there in Columbia for his order. He used to be, he used to uh, like work in finances um, and business of administration of sorts before he entered uh, the order. And now that's what he does for the order. And he, he carries them in that sense, in that uh, field. And it's a lot of work. And he tells me that oftentimes he would rather, he would rather be praying. He would rather be reading like spiritual works and doing all that. But, um, yeah, there's the obedience and doing uh, whatever the order calls you to do. Um, it's a great way to grow in to grow in virtue mm -hmm. and yeah, become more holy. Like uh, the Trappist, they have the motto "Ora et labora," work uh, in prayer. It's like when you're working, that is prayer in a way. Mm -hmm. um, like if you're doing something you don't want to do, just the obedience. That's almost in a way more powerful than any like book you could read or like prayer you could make uh by your own um preference i guess so just uh that strict obedience yeah the trappists have the same uh same motto or slogan as the benedictines yeah <laughs> oh wow okay when were they when were they well, they the are trappists? they are uh they originated from the benedictines uh Oh, okay. They're actually, um, 
So they come from the Cistercians, uh, founded by Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux. I, I, think, I think I said it uh, correctly the first time. Uh, how do you how do you say that? Uh, it's like Bernard or something. It's not Bernard, like the dog. It's that's not the. Correct I would have said it like that. That's how I would have said it. They all they all uh, correct me when I say it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not gonna make it another attempt. But uh, so yeah, and they um they came from France actually as well. Uh, they have that in common, the Society mm -hmm. of Mary. Now, I'm not really sure the year. Um, maybe the 1700s as well, but they were known for their silence. That was their entire thing. Yeah, yeah. But Clairvaux, out of in, in Cito, uh, he began got there in the 1100s. Yeah, so they actually like they split off from the Cistercians in France, though. So like a little later, it wasn't that early. The Cistercians sprung from the Benedictines. Yeah, and starting okay. with with Bernard's Abbey and Clairvaux. Well, yeah, so uh, I guess there's almost um, almost three generations of Ora and et la Ora there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, uh, one thing uh, people mistake about the Trappists is that they have to be silent when they're working. Uh, a few of them, they like the silence, uh, and you'll understand that working with them, but mm -hmm. some of them uh, are the best talkers you'll meet. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's just the silence in the monastery, but um, they're also they they stick to the rule, the rule of Saint Benedict. Uh, mm -hmm. Does your order stick to that as well? Uh, so Andy? we have our own rule, but it is very much out of the Benedictines. But we have mm -hmm. certain pieces that you can say, oh, this is very much a Jesuit influence on us. You can say that this is very much a Dominican influence on us. You can say that this is this is very much of so it's like a mishma. It's Father Shama took the parts that he thought made sense from these other different orders and brought them into the Marianists. So the distinction of at present we're not told you're going to get a brother, but it's more does this brother make sense for us as a community right now for him to join us? Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we're told that, uh, but other times it's, it's a, it's a discernment process that goes on. Um, the value on spiritual direction and spiritual reading very much come out of the, the Jesuit tradition, the, the pieces of, I would posit our silence of passions in our system of virtues would be comparable to am I deciding something in desolation or in consolation, which would be very much out of the Jesuit experience. So we've taken pieces from that have been known to work for different religious orders and grafted them and Father Thomas grafted them into his tree somehow. And <laughs> So community life works in religious life. Yeah. Um, it's probably the main thing about religious life, mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a value on the brothers entering the apostolate and living in community, whether that apostolate is a student, whether that apostolate is in one of the works or out of the works, it's still living in the common life. Yeah. So with, with the Dominicans, that piece on the intellectual formation, for us, it does not necessarily mean that we're all going to the university, but it does mean that we all have a set level of intellectual formation, um, like some basic philosophy, some basic theology, um, that we're all the same and understanding that the rest of the formation goes for the different works. So that might mean trade school. Because we want to say that our work is in the schools. And when we say that people think as teachers, but we do need people to check on the plumbing. 
check why the electricity is out. And for some brothers, they have that aptitude to be able to enter into the trades just fine. And they're perfectly, they're perfectly fine, very holy men. And their work is done to support, in a way, the teaching brothers. So the teaching brothers can enter into the direct apostolate, knowing that the roof isn't going to literally crash over their heads. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, that's that's a good uh, like metaphor for the need of a, the community. Uh, people are supporting you in a way. But yeah, Simon, go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering. You had something so, to say. Uh, Brother Andrew, you were saying like how your order and many orders do this is a combination of like different rules and different orders. Mm -hmm. um, but what's unique about the Society of Mary is what's in the name is Mary. So mm -hmm. I was interested, what, how does Mary play into your day-to-day -day life and the, the rule and practices of your order specifically? So some easy parts, it will be unusual to find a Marianist house without at least one image of Mary. Mm -hmm. um, for us, we take Our Lady of the Pillar as the major one. Uh, for those who don't know, her shrine is in Saragossa, and Father Shamnad arrived in Saragossa as his, to begin his exile on the vigil of her feast. Our Lady of the Pillar is maybe the first apparition, could be by location. I mean, that's how early we're talking. Yeah. With, with St. James being sent to Spain to evangelize and feeling exhausted and burned out and seeing no fruit, and Mary appears to him and says, do not worry, all will be fine. Mm -hmm. And then he's motivated to found, and then ultimately in in a city named after the Caesar, where Saragossa is a truncation of Caesar Augusta, mm -hmm. um, we have the foundation the, the first apparition by, or by location i don't know whether mary was on earth or not during that time um, but it, it's so early um, yeah so looking at her especially as pillar of faith you'll see some different images depending on where the community is so it will not be unusual to see our lady of guadalupe in latin american houses but not in european houses Mm -hmm. So part of it is the local the local devotion to Mary, and part of it is what is our major devotion. We take as our as our grand feast day the holy name of Mary. So that we can just cover them all. Yeah. yeah. But we've taken her name um, as in a way to remind us that it is her gentleness that helped form Christ. And so we should take on her gentleness in a way to help form those we meet. That's a good uh, way of looking at it. Um, to form Christ within her, she had gentleness and obedience to God. So like, um, to grow Christ within us, we also have to have those same things. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that. So, yeah, are you a big fan of the rosary? A lot of the brothers, are they a fan? A lot of the brothers. And it's not a requirement for us to say it now. I'm, I'll admit I'm more partial to, to looking at the litanies more. Mm -hmm. I'll pray the rosary on occasion. It's something that I'll use with an app because I don't want to be stuck on the creed and wonder, am I remembering the right changes now or anything like that? It's like, no, the apps, they'll, they'll be saying it. Franciscan University of Steubenville's app will clearly make sure they're using the proper creed with the changes that have happened since the liturgy, since the liturgy changed in 2011 to a different translation as opposed to yeah. what I was remembering from before. 
from uh, like we to I, and they added consubstantial. Well, that's the Nicene Creed. But the Apostles' yeah. Creed has had some oh, apostles. very fine changes in it, too. Yeah. I was unfamiliar with that. The principal one being I to we, the I and the we. Change. Yeah. So, yeah, I have a couple more questions, I guess. Uh, going back a bit, you said, uh, or I'll just say, like, a lot of people in the outside world, they have opinions about what religious orders should change or improve upon, get rid of. Mm -hmm. Um I'll ask you, yeah, I'll ask those two things. So what do you think your order needs to get rid of? We'll go with the fun one first. <laughs> <laughs> that they need to move past or... Um, I mean, besides our sinfulness, because that's really what I would start with, because... The individual. Because we are sinners first. And the more that we can grow in virtue, the better we'll be in community life. really good answer um so yeah what do you think your order does right then what uh should other orders take from your order as inspiration i'm not going to answer that second question because mm -hmm. it suggests that they're doing something wrong and they're being faithful to the mission that they've been given. Yeah. So I, I think for us, looking at our system of virtues as a means to grow in holiness, as a means to help young people grow in holiness. I think for us, having this presence in virtue and this sense of we're forming you as individuals really makes us in some ways open to the Holy Spirit to give spiritual counsel. Mm -hmm. so that, yeah, what, well, finish your thought first. Um, that, that spiritual counsel that that is appropriate for the person, whether that's here's a different way to pray or maybe you need to read something different um, or maybe you just here's a here is smattering of prayers but let's just be faithful to the time and not worry about the method of prayer mm -hmm. i think that's something that a lot of the brothers have have that solid spiritual peace within them that can be attractive and can make many of us open for that deeper conversation very very quickly yeah and so i think uh going a bit deeper on that um what is the impact you in particular think uh that you have you have to or you have um to give to the outside world or the impact that you can make on others. Anything uh, special to you in setting like an example for others or in helping others in a way? I think it's a reminder that brothers are a valid vocation in the church. That we provide a a path to holiness that is oftentimes hidden in the church. Um, well, in in a church that in the, in the United States we've gotten spoiled by having a very large number of priests. If we were to co contrast that with Mexico, the Philippines, Brazil, and the last statistics I saw, which are old in comparison to what a sociologist would want to use. Um, yeah. The number of priests of those three nations combined was still less than the United States. And each of those three nations had more Catholics than the United States. So I think the challenge of the brother vocation in our church is for 
everyone to understand it's acceptable, it's normal, it's reasonable for man to want to enter a religious life and not be a priest, but still know that that man is serving God. That's a really good response. And hopefully that's helpful to any of the listeners, like if they're discerning the religious life or even the priesthood. Yeah, I think uh, it, it really is a big commitment, but I think you've touched upon some of the helpful aspects, uh, like how it can help you improve as a person uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just taking on that responsibility. So yeah, it's been a really good episode. Um, I have one last question, but Simon, do you have any more questions? No. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, my question is, do you think that religious life uh, will last until the end of time, uh, like till the apocalypse happens? Do you think there will still be monks and brothers and sisters around uh, during the book of Revelation when that comes to fruition? And I can expand upon that. Why I even ask that? Um, so I kind of have this theory that, like, uh, we're kind of on the reverse now. So, like, Christianity, there was 300 years from the um, death of Christ until Christianity became the official religion of Rome. And so, in a way, like, during that time, it was a really uh, tumultuous time. A lot of changes in the church. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, you had this, you had, but a lot of people becoming Christian, but nowadays you have a lot of people dropping away from the church. So in a way we're going like reverse, we're going into the persecutions, into Christianity, no longer being the official religion. So that's the switch. Um, but monks uh, and people in religious life really didn't start until after uh, Christianity became the official religion. Um, so I think following that pattern, um, I might say that like religious life will no longer exist. It will be um, assimilated into like just the regular church. Uh, there will no longer be a need for monks, a, no longer a need for brothers and sisters. Um, yeah, I think like I could expand upon that even more. So like you see some of the um, duties that the priest used to have or the deacon used to have they're replaced by like lectors or um servers altar servers uh communion servers but um so yeah do you think the need for religious life will ever disappear in the life of the church no <laughs> that's a really good answer no I, I, and i don't think that um that's a really heavy question, a really it, simple it, answer. It is a simple answer, um, and it's intentionally simple because you're working under an assumption that revelation will literally happen as it's saying. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, I'm not even worrying about that. <laughs> As I'm, what I'm going to say is, as long as there's church, there will be religious. We may look different. Our communities might be much more scattered, um, such as if we were to take a look at what religious life looked like under, an, in, in Eastern Europe under the communist powers, in many of those places, it was very different than what we know of it in the States. Yeah. But even, even in Japan, when there were no priests, when there were no brothers and sisters, they still had the valid sacraments of baptism. That was all they were going with. And what was nurturing them, in addition to the blood of their martyrs, was the prayers of the religious throughout the world, praying for the church as a whole. There are some folks that I've gotten to know in the past who are convinced that if it, that the prayers of the monks and the nuns in 
the 500s, the 600s, the 1100s, um, if it weren't for those prayers, the world today would be very different. It would be worse. I don't, I, that I would be the implication, but I would say it'd be very different. And I think maybe, I, this is all speculation any, at this point, so don't be quote yeah. tweeting me out of context here, folks. <laughs> um, but I think more, maybe as, as, as a human family, it would have taken us longer to get to this point. Of, of of the of the technological progress of the intellectual formation that is more or less readily accessible I think these pieces are what would have taken a lot longer maybe maybe there wouldn't have been a journey in 1492 to the new world, but maybe that would have been in 1592. Maybe it would have been 1992, <laughs> but he's much more convinced that the world we have today would not have been possible because of their prayers. And as long as we have a church there will be a need for religious. And I purposely say that because as we go to look at Paul's letter to the Corinthians and his discourse in love, he then talks about faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these are love because love is the one that will endure when we have no need of faith or a hope anymore. Yeah, there's no need for those in heaven. Mm -hmm. So they disappear. Mm -hmm. Because the, in heaven, there's only love. Mm -hmm. Although it's, when I get to heaven, I'll ask God, so you won't care to ask God <laughs> that question. You, you will be in the presence of love. And all those doubts will, be, will have been burned away, purified away. So that way you are capable of only love. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And nothing else. So as long as there is a church, there will be religious. Yeah, I think to clarify some of what I said uh, just a second ago, like I was more so thinking of monks because the monks uh, really didn't come about until um, after Constantine, after Emperor Constantine. They went out to the, into the desert to escape like... Uh, the extravagances of like all these aristocrats becoming Christian because it was in vogue. Um, so that's kind of where the monastic uh, lifestyle came from. But the religious lifestyle that comes directly, it's in the Bible. Uh, St. Paul says it's better to be, um, what's the word, rather than married. Uh, it's better to be consecrated to God, I think. Uh, that's what he was going for. So yeah. Um, so there's definitely virgins and uh, people in religious life consecrated to God. Um, and in a way that's like, uh, it's more perfect than marriage. It's not a physical uh, marriage. It's a spiritual marriage mm -hmm. to Christ. Uh, have you ever read Bernard of Clairvaux any? I, I have not read much. So no, if I have, it's been ages yeah. ago that I would not remember. I'll see if you remember this. So he talks a lot about like how we're all supposed to be brides of Christ uh, in a way. We're all supposed to be married to Christ. Uh. Mm -hmm. See, so, yeah, I think that's the point of religious life. That's like what St. Teresa of Sioux talks about a lot. Uh. And she speaks uh, like, I like the chapter where she describes like a wedding, mm -hmm. uh, a wedding taking place and she's getting married to Jesus. And I think that was before she entered the convent. Uh, mm hmm so yeah um, do you think that's like the purpose of uh, your commitment to religious life I, the I mystical marriage the, to jesus the, the calling of the christian is to sainthood 
And in the Catholic Church, this is expressed in one of four different ways. Either a freely embraced single life, a freely embraced married life, a freely embraced diocesan life, or a freely embraced religious life. And to me, it's going back to that question of being called to holiness. Bernard of Clairvaux, it makes sense that you would know this more than I, because you have the influence everywhere <laughs> where you work. Um, so I think I would say his sentiment in different language. Mm -hmm. So Clairvaux, so Bernard, Bernard's point is we're called to holiness. Yeah. And in that call to holiness, we will become that bride of Christ, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. We know that the church fathers, and we talk about the church and its entirety as the bride of Christ. At the church, the mystical body of Christ is also the church, the bride of Christ. So as if we are going to grow in holiness, we become more and more worthy of that union with Christ. Whether you want to uh, uh, to call that the body of Christ or the bride of Christ, it's that union with Christ that is the important part that St. Bernard of Clairvaux is trying to draw out of us. Yeah. Uh, it's Bernard, I think. That's how they pronounce it, Bernard. <laughs> Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, I said it correctly. Uh, so yeah, um, I I thought of another question. Uh, so for like just anyone in general, what is a piece of advice that you can give them that will help them become a saint? Uh, so what's like the secret to becoming a saint in your opinion? We want, we want the secret, Brother Andrew. Secret. Well, I don't know if I know that yet. Um, but for me, it, it comes down to being open to the will of the Holy Spirit in our lives and knowing, is this truly the will of God or is this the will of my pride? Mm -hmm. And as we grow in prayer, as we grow in virtue, that prideful tendency will diminish. And we will better know God's true will in our lives. Yeah, and that's just going back to the Our Father, Thy will be done. It's the most simple prayer. Yeah. Yeah, we can end with an Our Father if you want, if y'all would like. Okay. I would like to. I always try to end for prayer when I can. Sometimes it's uh, kind of hard to end for prayer, but I think we can sure. do it. We'll pray with the Lord's Prayer, and then I'll close with the Marianist Doxology. That is one of our traditional prayers. So, All right, take us away. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Son, Spirit. Holy Spirit. Our Father, Our Father who Lord, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be glorified in all places through the Immaculate Virgin Mary. Amen. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, it's been a good show. It's been a great show, one of the best. Uh, and we still have a lot of viewers here, so they must have liked it as well. Uh, good night to everyone. God bless, and have a happy Sunday, the Lord's Day. <laughs>